Depending on the location and time zone of your participation, I bid each of you a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Michelle Sunita Kumar, and on behalf of the Asian International Arbitration Center, or more colloquially known as the AIAC, I am pleased to welcome everyone to Drex Talk Kuala Lumpur 2020, the very first in the Southeast Asian region. The AIAC takes immense pride to host the third Drex Talk, an initiative that has witnessed the giants of arbitration contributing to a common and accessible dispute resolution knowledge bank. As a Drex Fellow from Malaysia myself and as Deputy Head of Legal at the AIAC, it gives me great pleasure that this Drex Talk is being organised in a unique manner during these exceptional times. As we begin the decade of the 2020s, one situation is inevitable for both businesses and legal communities across the world. Unprecedented challenges will come our way. We've spoken so much about digitization, and the time is now upon us as we witness both these communities having to innovate and adapt with resilience to overcome any hurdles as we have seen in the last few months. If one were to look for a silver lining, the challenges that the year 2020 has brought with it has certainly seen the fostering of solidarity among all businesses and legal services stakeholders. Witnessing the proactiveness showcased by dispute resolution practitioners across the world, the Drex Talk provides an alternative forum that hosts talks by renowned dispute resolution experts on a contemporary issue or subject of critical significance. Today we have amongst us one such legal stalwart from Singapore who will deliver our Drex talk. To introduce the Drex speaker and elaborate more on the topic of our Drex talk, I invite Mr. Christopher Leong, managing partner of Chuyen company Chiang and Arif from Malaysia who will serve as our Drex introducer. To briefly introduce Christopher, he acts as counsel in domestic and international arbitrations. He is empaneled as an arbitrator with the AIAC and the Hainan International Arbitration Court. He is also a member of the AIAC Advisory Council. In the field of dispute resolution, Christopher has been named as a leading individual and lawyer in Malaysia by Asia Pacific Legal 500 since 2004, Chambers Asia since 2009, the Asia Law Leading Lawyer since 2008, and as a market leading lawyer in the 2017, 2018, and 2019 editions of the Asia Law Profiles. Christopher will be directing some questions to Michael following the latter's conclusion of the Drex talk. We are also, of course, pleased to have a wide audience from across the world witnessing this live webcast whom Christopher will also be addressing. Without any further ado, Christopher, the stage is yours. Thank you, Michelle, for the kind words. And a very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honour and a great pleasure to be given the opportunity to introduce the topic and our most distinguished speaker, Dr. Michael Huang, SC, to all our participants tuning into this Drax talk. In introducing this topic, I will take a bird's eye view on my thoughts surrounding UN Citral Model Law's effects and application in the Malaysian legal system with a specific reference to Section 37, Subsection 4 of the Malaysian Arbitration Act, 2005. This is the Malaysian equivalent to Article 34, Sub-Article 3 of the Model Law. In today's day and age, arbitration has evolved as a popular dispute resolution mechanism in the international commercial domain. It transcends geographical borders and sovereign jurisdictions. It enables trade disputes to be resolved between private entities and states through international commercial arbitration and investment treaty arbitration. This is because the parties to arbitration in the formation of their contract or legal relationship and by their own bargain, chose arbitration as their agreed method of dispute resolution. Arbitration, therefore, provides for an ordered dispute resolution mechanism, leading to an enforceable award or judgment by an arbitral panel. This is now becoming an essential underpinning of global trade and commerce. International commerce and investment treaty arbitrations are now part and parcel 
of the global commercial and legal framework. The overriding objectives are that such commercial activities may be conducted in a predictable and uniform legal framework. The origins of the UN Citral Model Law can be found in a report by the UN Secretary General entitled Possible Features of a Model Law of International Commercial Arbitration. Among other things, the report declared that the ultimate goal of a model law would be to facilitate international commercial arbitration and to ensure its proper functioning and recognition. The final draft of the UN Citral Model Law was approved by UN Citral by way of resolution adopted in 1985 and subsequently by the UN General Assembly the following year. UN Citral recommended its model law for enactment by states as a part of their national legislation to promote a uniform standard in international arbitration across the globe. The model law constitutes a remarkable and authoritative accomplishment in the field of arbitration. The model law also addresses the disparities contained within national arbitration laws and the model law is used as an instrument of harmonization, reflecting a worldwide consensus on the principles and important issues of international arbitration practice. A state is now considered to be progressive as an arbitral friendly jurisdiction by enacting or incorporating the model law in its national arbitration laws. In my humble opinion, Malaysia, with its rich diversity, traditions, and plurality, has always had, in some way, a culture suited to arbitration and alternate dispute resolution in general. The landscape of ADR in Malaysia has undergone a rapid and radical transformation in a very short span since the turn of the millennium in 2000. The Malaysian Arbitration Act 2005 is modelled extensively on the 1985 revision of the model law, which replaced the old Arbitration Act 1952. It brought about the much needed changes to support the business and legal communities in Malaysia. Through the 2006 revision of the model law, the 2018 amendments to the Malaysian Arbitration Act leading to the infamous sections 42 and 43 being repealed. Repealing section 42 of the Act has two important implications. Firstly, parties will no longer be able to bring questions of law before the court of first instance after an award has been rendered. Rather, if parties or the arbitral tribunal require clarification on a question of law, they will have recourse to the High Court during arbitral proceedings pursuant to Section 41 of the 2005 Act. Secondly, Section 37 of the Arbitration Act 2005 is now the only recourse parties may have in seeking to set aside an award. This is the provision which has been used by Malaysian courts to set aside arbitral awards. The grounds for setting aside an award under Section 37 are similar to the grounds under Article 34 of the UN Citral Model Law and the relevant provisions of the New York Convention. I would not delve deeply into the intricacies of Article 34 of the Model Law as our distinguished speaker would do a better job than I, but I wish to highlight that the principle of finality of an award is one of the fundamental tenets of arbitral proceedings. On the other hand, to set aside an award would mean to declare the award to be disregarded in whole or in part. An arbitration award which is set aside is not enforceable and is considered invalid. Section 37 of the Malaysian Arbitration Act 2005 contains an exhaustive list of grounds on which the High Court can set aside an award. These grounds are largely similar to Article 34 of the UN Citral Model Law so I shall concentrate my comments specifically on Section 37, Subsection 4 of the Malaysian Arbitration Act 2005, which says that, and I quote, an application for setting aside may not be made after the expiry of 90 days from the date on which the party making the application had received the award 
or if a request has been made under Section 35 from the date on which that request had been disposed of by the arbitral tribunal. Interestingly enough, Section 37, subsection 5 expressly provides that this strict time requirement does not apply to applications made for setting aside awards which are induced or affected by fraud or corruption, the evidence of which is most likely to surface some time after the award is published. However, this is not reflected in the model law. As you will hear from our distinguished speaker, Dr. Michael Huang Essi, the requirement in many common law jurisdictions is that this time limit is strict. Whether it is three months under the model law or some other time limit as imposed by domestic legislation. Although there is no express provision for an extension of time under section 37, subsection 4. In 2011, the Court of Appeal in Malaysia, in the case of the Government of Lao People's Democratic Republic and Thai Lao Light Night Company Limited, a Thai company, decided that the courts nevertheless have the jurisdiction to grant an extension of time to set aside an arbitral award. This was subsequently followed in the case of Kumbang Serantau Sindram Bahad and JEKS Engineering Sindram Bahad, which held that the court adopts a minimalist approach when dealing with arbitration and arbitration matters. Such an approach does not spell the lack or want of jurisdiction of the court, but rather that the court declines jurisdiction in such matters giving effect to and enforcing the contractual obligations of the parties instead. The bedrock of the concept of party autonomy enshrined in Section 35 of the Malaysian Arbitration Act. Ladies and gentlemen, for today's discussion, Dr. Michael Huang S.C. will speak to the question posed for the Drex talk being, and I quote, can an arbitral award be set aside under Article 34 of the model law? if the application is not made within the three months period permitted by Article 34, sub-Article 3, a comparative study across model law jurisdictions. Close quote. I'm informed that Dr. Huang will explore authorities from Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, Canada, India, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Malaysia. This will provide for a broad survey of the available case law, which I'm told has never been put together in one place. Now a little bit about our distinguished speaker. Michael, who is known to many of us, is a graduate of Oxford University, both at undergrad and postgraduate levels, having gained entry by a college scholarship awarded after an open nationwide examination. He also served as a former visiting and later adjunct professor at the National University of Singapore. In 1997, he was appointed as one of the first 12 senior counsel of the Supreme Court of Singapore. His first appointments include being a judicial commissioner of the Supreme Court of Singapore, president of the Law Society of Singapore, a commissioner of the United Nations Compensation Commission, a vice chairman of the International Court of Arbitration of the International Chamber of Commerce, a court member of the London Court of International Arbitration, a trustee of the Dubai International Arbitration Center, a member of the board of the Swiss Arbitration Association and the Hainan International Arbitration Court, and a council member of the International Council of Arbitration for Sport. Michael has also served as Singapore's non-resident ambassador to Argentina, having been ambassador to Switzerland. After working for one of Singapore's premier legal firms, Allen & Gladhill, for more than 30 years, Dr. Michael Huang SC established his own practice as an international arbitrator and mediator, as well as an independent senior counsel in 2003. In 2014, he was conferred an honorary LLD by the University of Sydney, where he was a teacher in 1966 to 1967. 
He retired as the Chief Justice of the Dubai International Financial Center Courts at the end of 2018 after having served in that post since 2010 and before that as Deputy Chief Justice for five years. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dr. Michael Huang SC. Thank you. Good day, everyone. I'm Michael Huang, an independent international arbitrator and senior counsel based in Singapore, but hearing cases from all over the world. I'm an advisory board member of the Trex Talks. I've been practicing in the field of dispute resolution for five decades in all its forms as a counsel, a judge, an arbitrator, a mediator, as well as an academic. I've been lecturing and writing about all these aspects of dispute resolution for almost the same length of time, and I've published two volumes of my selected essays on international arbitration and other aspects of dispute resolution. This year, I'm pleased to have been chosen to be the DREX speaker at the DREX Talk Kuala Lumpur, and I'm honored to be following in the footsteps of the two previous lecturers, Doug Jones and Emmanuel Gaillard. I'm particularly pleased to be collaborating with AIAC for this lecture, as I'm one of the last Singapore practitioners to have practiced in Malaysia and have always retained in contact with Malaysian practitioners, especially when I was serving as president of the Law Society of Singapore. In this session, I will be speaking about the three-month time limit under Article 34.3 of the Ang Trial Model Law, and I will provide a comparative overview across seven model law jurisdictions, as well as one other quasi-model law country. This is a short but very important provision and has now generated a significant body of international case law interpreting it. The main appeal of the Ang Trial Model Law has always been its role as a beacon of international legal convergence. The logical con consequence of this is that jurisdictions which adopt the model law should accept the ethos of regarding the domestic arbitration law as part of international law. This should be achieved by their courts placing great weight on the travaux preparatoire and legislative intention of the model law when interpreting the relevant statutory provisions of the model law or their own statutory adaptations of the model law into their domestic law. Of course, countries are allowed to adopt the model law language with such modifications that they deem suitable. But where they choose to take the model law language wholesale or with non-material changes, their courts should be encouraged to refer to international jurisprudence and the history of the enactment of the model law. I refer you especially to Article 2A1 of the model law as just one example, which I suggest supports my contention. And I quote, in the interpretation of this law, regard is to be had to its international origin and to the need to promote uniformity in its application and the observance of good faith. The model law is particularly prevalent in the Asia-Pacific region, and for purposes of this lecture, I will include South Asia as part of this region. A casual observer would therefore probably expect the courts of Asia-Pacific countries to refer extensively to case law from each other's jurisdictions and to harmonize inter interpretations of equivalent provisions where possible. I became interested in this issue after having been asked to contribute a chapter to an upcoming book on harmonization of international commercial laws. And I was chosen to write a chapter on how the New York Convention and the model law were exemplars of a successful international convention being so widely accepted as to become in effect mainstream public international law. And originally, I had started out with that impression, meaning that at least the common law courts of the Asia-Pacific countries would interpret similar provisions similarly. Instead, I've had to add an addendum to that book chapter by inserting a caveat about the lack of uniformity in interpretation of a short but important provision of the model law, Article 34.3, which is, of course, the subject of my talk today. Article 34.3 reads as follows. An application for setting aside may not be made, and note the words may not. After three months have elapsed from the date on which the party making that application had received the award, or if a request had been made under Article 33, 
and Article 33 deals with correction, addition, and interpretation of the original award from the date on which that request had been disposed of by the arbitral tribunal. What I would like to discuss today is how the common law countries that have adopted the model law have treated this three-month time limit. On a plain reading, it would appear that any setting aside application made later than three months after the making of the arbitral award cannot be entertained by the court. In other words, you would think that the three-month time limit is strict and that courts would generally not be allowed to extend it. For the sake of convenience, I will, for the rest of this talk, refer to the three-month time limit as the window time period. As some of you in Malaysia may remember, I gave a lecture about the comparative Singapore, Malaysian, Hong Kong approaches to the window time period in Kuala Lumpur in 2018. So I think it is appropriate to kick off by refreshing our memory about what the position seemed to be a couple of short years ago. The discussion should begin with the 2003 Singapore case of ABC against XYZ, decided by Justice Judith Prakash, who is now a judge of Singapore's Court of Appeal, as well as the DIFC Court of Appeal. In this case, the applicants had initially applied for an arbitral, trial, an arbitral award to be set aside well within the window time period. But they then later applied for leave to amend the original motion in order to add six new grounds for setting aside to the original application. The question was whether these new grounds were time barred because they had been made outside the window time period. Justice Prakash treated this application to amend as effectively a new application. This was because new grounds were being added which did not arise out of substantially the same facts that were specified in the original application. In her view, allowing the application to amend would have opened a back door for parties to bypass the window time period by putting in a basic setting aside application within the time limit and then supplementing that original application with further grounds at their pleasure. This is clearly at odds with the principle of finality and certainty of arbitral awards, which Justice Prakash obviously felt was paramount, especially as she had been designated our specialist arbitration judge. However, just focusing on Justice Prakash's interpretation of Article 34.3, her honour held that the words, quote, may not, unquote, in Article 34.3 had to be interpreted as cannot. This was to give effect to the intention behind the article, which was to limit the time during which an arbitral award may be challenged. In other words, the Singaporean courts had no discretion to extend the window time period. Justice Prakash came to this conclusion purely on the basis of textual analysis without reference to other possible lines of argument through which her honour might have reached the same result. However, even though the 2006 addition to the model law had not yet come into force, which I just read to you, Justice Prakash did make a reference to the legislative history of the model law in construing its provisions. Next, in 2011, it was Malaysia's turn to consider the issue in the Thai Lao series of decisions. In that case, a dispute arose between the government of Laos and a Thai company regarding a concession to mine lignite. Arbitration proceedings were commenced with the seat in Kuala Lumpur. The arbitral tribunal issued and delivered an award against the government of Laos. After nine months after the award was issued, the government of Laos filed an application at the Kuala Lumpur High Court to set aside the award together with a prayer to extend time for it to file its application to set aside the award. At first instance, the government's application was dismissed. In the High Court, Justice Hamid Sultan Abu Bakar, who later became a member of the Malaysian Court of Appeal, had to consider the meaning of Section 37.4 of the Malaysian Arbitration Act 2005. This provision is substantially identical to Article 34.3 of the model law, except that the window time period in Malaysia is fixed at 90 days instead of three months. His finding was that this provision conferred discretion on the court to extend time 
in respect of a late application to set aside an award. The case of ABC against XYZ was brought to Justice Hamid Sultan's attention, as well as the New Zealand case of Downer Hill joint venture against the government of Fiji. These cases supported the interpretation that the Article 34.3 window time period was strict. However, Justice Hamid Sultan departed from these cases in his reasoning, holding without citing authority that the Malaysian courts did have discretion to extend the time limit in appropriate cases. As you will appreciate, this is obviously different from the position in ABC against XYZ. But his lordship also found that the factual situation presented in this case did not warrant an exercise of curial discretion to extend time. The setting aside application had been made nine months late, so the delay was not merely nominal, and there were no serious extenuating factors that might explain why there had been such a delay. More important, his Lordship also expressly noted the importance of harmonizing the interpretation of model law provisions with other jurisdictions, as well as the need to observe the spirit of minimal court intervention in arbitration matters. These factors should have weighed in favor of not extending time. However, Hamid Sultan also mentioned that the Laos government had informed the High Court that they had not been made aware of the three-month deadline and the resources had been tied up fighting enforcement applications in other jurisdictions. This apparently did not change Justice Hamid Sultan's decision that the facts did not warrant an exercise of his discretion to extend time. The slide sets out some quotations from his judgment which illustrate what I have been describing. The case then went to the Malaysian Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal came to a different conclusion on the facts. While agreeing with Justice Hamid Sultan's interpretation that the courts did have discretion to extend the window time period. The Court of Appeal, comprising of Justices of Appeal Ramli bin Haji Ali, Jeffrey Tan and Zahara Ibrahim, derived this general power from paragraph 8 of the Schedule to the Courts of Judicature Act 1964 and held that the Arbitration Act of 2005 contained no express exclusion of this general power. Unfortunately, the Lordships did not discuss the last words of paragraph 8 of the Schedule to the Courts of Judicature Act 1964, which are highlighted in green on the slide, and I'll read the words out. Provided that this provision shall be without prejudice to any written law relating to limitation, unquote. And they did not consider whether or not Section 37.4 was a written law relating to limitation. Having found that they had a general power to extend the window time period, the Court of Appeal decided to exercise the discretion to do so. They did this on the grounds that the applicant, the government of Laos, was a sovereign state, and the Court of Appeal felt that some allowance had to be made for the slow speed at which state machinery made decisions. They also placed weight on the fact that Laos was not conversant with Malaysian law and apparently not received adequate advice from its then local council. And for the record, I have not checked who were these local council advising the government at the time of fighting the arbitration and the filing of the setting aside application. These were both factors leading to the Court of Appeal to find that this was an appropriate case for them to exercise their discretion. The Court of Appeal also disagreed with Justice Hamid Sultan's comments that Malaysia should have had regard to conformity with the interpretations of model law provisions by the courts of other model law jurisdictions. And you can see the quote on the slide. The upshot of it, this is that the Court of Appeal appeared to treat the Arbitration Act as just another domestic Malaysian statute of no special importance, and therefore the Malaysian courts had absolute power of interpretation of Article 37.4, including a general power to extend time for procedural matters. This position is unfortunately quite at odds with the spirit of the model law. After the Malaysian Thai Lao cases, it was Hong Kong's turn to look at the issue. This was analyzed in the 2016 Hong Kong case of Sun Tian Gang against Hong Kong and China Gas Jilin Limited. 
Here I wish to say that the facts of this case are quite exceptional and unfortunately demonstrate the old saying, quote, hard cases make bad law, unquote. This is a highly unusual case in the facts, and this possibly influenced Justice Mimi Chan, who is one of the most respected arbitration judges in Asia, to take a questionable interpretation of Article 34.3 to ov overcome what she felt was an unjust arbitration award that had been procured as a result of a bizarre and unfair situation. The facts of this case are rather complicated, but I will try and pick out the most relevant snippets for my audience today. In essence, the original arbitration was commenced and concluded while Mr. Sun was in the custody of Chinese public security officers. It was not disputed that Hong Kong and China Gas knew that Mr. Sun had been detained in mainland China and was therefore unable to participate in the arbitration. Yet they decided to go ahead with the arbitration to the point that an arbitral award was rendered against Mr. Sun while Mr. Sun was still in custody. It was not clear that notice of the arbitration had even been validly served. Mr. Sun also alleged, and Justice Chan accepted, that he did not even receive the award upon being released from custody after around seven years of detention. In the event, Mr. Sun only saw the award in 2015, three years after he had been released. He eventually filed his application for setting aside about eight years after the date on which the arbitral award had supposedly been served on him. But Justice Chan found that all the alleged efforts at service of the award were invalid in law, as they were served at addresses where Mr. Sun no longer occupied for residential or working purposes. On these facts, Justice Mimi Chan found that first, Mr. Sun had not been validly served with the notice of the arbitration. Second, he had not been able to present his case. And third, the enforcement of the award against Mr. Sun would be contrary to the public policy of Hong Kong. She also found on the facts that Mr. Sun had not actually validly received the award in 2015, and therefore the window time period for a setting aside application had not begun to run even from that point. Therefore, her holding was actually that Mr. Sun's application was not out of time. But Justice Chan went on to further consider the position if she was wrong and Mr. Sun's setting aside application was indeed out of time. At that point, the question for Justice Chan was whether the court had discretion to grant an extension of the window time period for Mr. Sun. Justice Chan found that the court did indeed have such a discretion. Her approach was linguistic, based on Hong Kong case law, holding that the word may in Article 34.2 of the model law, which I quote, an arbitral award may be set aside by the court only if, and then these words were followed by the actual grounds for setting aside. Justice Chan said that these words connoted the existence of court discretion. She then found that this interpretation justified an analogous line of reasoning, which permitted a discretionary power to extend time, where the words, quote, may not, as appearing in Article 34.3. Justice Chan also said that Mr. Sun had not been allowed to present his case or to contradict statements which had been made against him. To deprive him of that opportunity would, in her view, shock the court's conscience and fundamental conceptions of justice. That's how strongly she felt about the circumstances of this case. So it is hardly surprising that she would feel strongly that justice had to be done for Mr. Sun. But I will show later that it is clear that her interpretation is not in step with how the other common law jurisdictions have looked at this issue. As far as I know, no one has written about the conflicting approaches taken in these three cases. After my lecture in 2018, I said that I wanted to write an article on this issue, but I also said that I would not be writing it until some court gave a comprehensive review of the three cases and the irre irreconcilable elements within them. And that opportunity has finally come. 
I now turn to the cases that appear to demonstrate the general shift back towards a strict interpretation of Article 34.3. First, in the 2012 Malaysian case of J.H.W. Wheels against Sharikat Bokos Shipping, Justice Muhammad Ali Arif Yusuf held that the words may not, could not reasonably be read as denoting a merely directory requirement. The window time period was therefore, in his view, strict. Justice Arif cited ABC against XYZ favorably in coming to his conclusion. Justice Arif also relied on the principle of statutory interpretation of the Latin maxim expressio unius est exclusio alterius, which means that if certain members of a class of things are expressly mentioned in a statutory provision, while mentioned while others are not, those not mentioned are impliedly excluded. Section 37.5 of the Malaysian Act expressly provides that the window time period will not apply where the alleged ground for setting aside is fraud or corruption, but it does not mention any other exception. The court therefore had no power to extend the window time period where fraud or corruption was not alleged. His lordship also relied on Section 8 of the Malaysian Arbitration Act to support his view that there was no room for court intervention. And I will come to this element a little later. The next case I want to explore is the 2015 High Court case of Kembang Serantau Sendiran Bahad against Jex Engineering Sendiran Bahad. This case was decided by Justice Mary Lim, who was elevated to the Federal Court of Malaysia earlier this year. In this case, the plaintiff had applied to the court for an extension of the window time period because it had filed its setting aside application one day late due to its solicitor's oversight. After engaging in a detailed textual analysis, Justice Mary Lim, as she then was, following Justice Arif's reasoning in JHW Reels, also held that the word may in Section 37.4 of the Malaysian Arbitration Act 2005 had to be given a mandatory meaning. Her leadership noted that the word may could be understood to, and I quote, connote the difference between the concept of mandatory and directory requirements. However, taking into account the intention behind Section 37.4 of the Arbitration Act in 2005, she interpreted the word may in that provision as a mandatory requirement. She explained that the sentence structure of the provision simply did not permit the use of the clearer word shall. This was a judgment of the Malaysian High Court that essentially contradicted the holding in the Thai Lao Court of Appeal decision. Section 8 of the Malaysian Arbitration Act 2005 was also central to Justice Mary Lim's reasoning in Kembang Sarantau. Justice Lim referred to the earlier High Court decision in JHW Reels, which had first raised the issue of the Malaysian version of Article 5 of the Model Law. And I have set out Article 5 as well as the 2005 version of the Malaysian Section 8, which is based on that article, as well as the 2011 amended version, which brings the language of the Malaysian version virtually identical to Article 5 of the Model Law. Justice Mary Lim commented as follows, and I quote, the significance of Section 8 could not be overstated, unquote. And she held that where the provisions of the Arbitration Act did not provide for court intervention, the court, and I quote again, ought to decline intervention even if the court would treat the matter differently if it was a non-arbitration matter, unquote. Justice Mary Lim suggested that Section 8 may not have been brought to the Court of Appeals' attention in the Tai Lao case. And if it had been, it would probably have made a material difference to the outcome. Her ladyship also drew attention to the fact that Section 8 had been amended in 2011 to more closely mirror the language of Article 5, and that these amendments may not have been enforced at the time the Court of Appeal decided the Tai Lao case. In Justice Lim's opinion, these two factors provided sufficient reason to depart 
from the Court of Appeals decision in Tai Lao. This is a really a wake-up call for the legal profession because the delay in filing after the window time period in Kambang Saran Tao was only one day. Finally, in the 2017 case of Triumph City Development against the Lango State Government, it was again uncontested that the plaintiff's setting aside application had been filed out of time. And the only issue was whether the court had jurisdiction to extend the window time period, and if so, whether it should do so. Justice Muhammad Yazid bin Mustafa agreed fully with Justice Mary Lim's reasoning in Kambang Sarantau and held that the window time period was strict with the courts having no discretion to extend it. His lordship also said that Section 8 of the Malaysian Arbitration Act 2005, and I quote, did not permit the court to intervene in any of the matters governed by the Act unless it provides other words, otherwise. And he stated that the inherent jurisdiction of the court could not be grounds for in intervening with any ma matter which had been stipulated for in the Act. What's really interesting is that in the latter two High Court cases, leave was sought to appeal to the Court of Appeal. In both cases, leave to appeal was denied. And this suggests implicitly that the present Court of Appeal agrees with the reasoning in these judgments. The status of the window time period in Malaysian law is therefore unfortunately somewhat unclear until the Court of Appeal or the Federal Court clearly states that the Court of Appeal judgment in the Thai Lao case is no longer good law. Coincidentally, the delay period in this last case was six days, which was exactly the same period as in the JHW Reels case. We can now return to the country when this issue was first explored by its courts, namely Singapore. Fittingly, the consolidating judgment that takes into account all the cases I have just discussed was decided in 2019 by an international court, the Singapore International Commercial Court, otherwise known as the SICC. In the case of BXS against BXT, International Judge Anselmo Reyes, who was formerly a High Court judge from Hong Kong, gave a comprehensive analysis of the relevant statutory provisions and the cases I've just discussed. And I would suggest that this judgment has now settled the controversy about the true interpretation of Article 34.3 because of the way in which Justice Reyes has analyzed all the relevant cases. Justice Reyes did not find the Thai Lao Court of Appeal case to be persuasive, noting that the Malaysian High Court in Kambang Sarantau and Triumph City had not followed the Court of Appeal's decision in Thai Lao. Justice Reyes also disagreed with Justice Mimi Chan's reasoning in Sun Tiangang. Essentially, he did not accept Justice Chan's reasoning that the interpretation of the word may should have any bearing on how the words may not should be interpreted. He also noted that Justice Chan appeared to be using subsidiary legislation, namely the Hong Kong Rules of the High Court, to interpret Article 34.3 of the Model Law, which has the status of primary legislation in Hong Kong. And Justice Reyes said that there was no explanation given as to why such a mode of interpretation was appropriate. Justice Reyes considered that the language of Article 34.3 was the correct starting point of the analysis. His Honour found that on a correct construction of Article 34.3, the window time period was strict and left the domestic courts no discretion to extend it. In coming to this conclusion, he followed Justice Prakash's analysis in the case of ABC against XYZ. Justice Reyes also touched on two further grounds for finding the window time period is strict which the other cases thus far had not discussed. First, referring to the analysis in the Thai Lao Court of Appeal case, he pointed out that the Court of Appeal had not considered whether Section 37.4 of the Malaysian Arbitration Act was a written law relating to limitation. Justice Reyes then analyzed the equivalent Singapore provision and found that under Singapore law, Article 34.3 
was in fact a written law relating to limitation, and therefore the court's general power to extend time, which was the same power as the Malaysian courts had, did not apply. Finally, Justice Reyes raised the issue of Article 5 of the Model Law, which I have already shown you in a previous slide when comparing this article with Section 8 of the Malaysian Act. This provides that courts should not intervene in arbitration matters governed by the Model Law, except where provided for in the Model Law itself. Justice Reyes found that this article, which has the force of law in Singapore, prevented him from using any power granted to the courts by domestic procedural law to intervene by extending the window time period. Justice Ray's judgment has since been approved without much discussion by another SICC international judge, Justice Roger Giles, who was the former head of the New South Wales Court of Appeal and my former fellow judge in the DIFC courts. Justice Giles decided the 2019 case of BXY against BXX. It has also been followed by another of Singapore specialist arbitration judges, Justice Belinda Ang, in the 2020 case of Bloomberry against Global Gaming Philippines. However, let me caveat that this latter case is currently under appeal to the Singapore Court of Appeal. This leads us nicely to the second section of my talk. After reviewing the cases I've just discussed, I then started to write my long-awaited article. But in the course of gathering the materials and conducting the necessary research for the paper, I found that there was actually a treasure trove of other decisions on Article 34.3 from other common law model countries, all of which buttressed the conclusions of Justice Mary Lim in Kembang Sarantau and Justice Anselmo Reyes in BXS against BXT. Subject to the decision of the Court of Appeal in the Bloomberry Appeal, the position in Singapore is now clear by virtue of two other High Court judges having accepted the position in BXS. But it turns out that other common law countries have, to a greater or lesser degree, also come to the same conclusion as Singapore. So I think it's a good idea to share all of these authorities, which to my knowledge have not yet been assembled together in one place. So I will now give you a quick bird's eye view of the available jurisprudence. Amazingly, the earliest and highest authority that has emerged is from India, where there are two relevant Indian Supreme Court cases. India is not officially a model law country, but it passed a new Arbitration and Conciliation Act in 1996, which copied many provisions of the model law, which is why I can call it a quasi-model law country. Happily, it has an equivalent of Article 34.3. This is, guess what, Section 34.3 of the 1996 Arbitration Act, which should now be on the screen. The only difference is that there is an additional proviso to allow the court to entertain a set setting aside application made not more than 30 days late if the applicant was prevented by sufficient cause from filing the application within the window time period. This proviso reflects the ability of countries to take on as much or as little they would like from the model law, as well as adding new variations to existing sections uh, or omitting parts of existing sections of the model law. Let me first talk about the 2001 case of Union of India against Popular Construction Company, which predates even ABC against XYZ. The facts of the case are not material to the discussion. The issue in dispute was whether the Indian courts could use their general power to extend time, which is derived from Section 5 of the Indian Limitation Act 1963. And they used that power to extend the window time period to allow a setting aside application that had been made more than three months after the end of the window period. I'm sorry, that was the application for an extension of the window time period. The Indian Supreme Court held that there had no power to do so for two reasons. First, there was a saving provision in the Indian Limitation Act, which said that certain sections of the Limitation Act did not apply if they had been, and I quote, 
expressly excluded by another, and I quote again, special law. The Supreme Court found that the Arbitration Act 1996 was indeed a special law. Going further, it was willing to read down the requirement for an express exclusion. Section 34.3 of the Indian Arbitration Act did not expressly exclude the application of the Limitation Act, but the Supreme Court found it sufficient that the exclusion of the Limitation Act was necessarily implied, and those are the words they used in their judgment. The end conclusion was that the words of Section 34.3 of the Indian Arbitration Act expressly excluded the application of Section 5 of the Limitation Act. And this shows the great lengths to which the Supreme Court went to uphold the finality of this arbitral award. Second, the court also had regard to Section 5 of the Indian Arbitration Act was also in the same terms as Article 5 of the Model Law. The court found that this provision applied, which meant that there was no scope for the court to intervene by extending time for the setting aside application. This is rather amazing given that India is not even a model law country. I now turn to the second Indian Supreme Court, which was decided in 2018. And the case is uh, P. Radha Bai against P. Ashok Kumar. In this case, the court confirmed that the words, quote, may not, unquote, in section 34.3 must be interpreted as cannot. The Singapore decision of ABC against XYZ was cited favorably in support of this conclusion. The Supreme Court also held that the exclusion of a provision of Indian limitation law was necessarily implied when one looked at the scheme and object of the Arbitration Act. The court further found that applying the Limitation Act would create uncertainty in the enforcement of arbitral awards. And finally, the court noted that allowing the application of the Limitation Act would be contrary to the model law principle that the window time period should be absolute. Let me move on to other common law jurisdictions which have adopted the model law. First, Australia. The position here appears to be that the window time period is strict and not capable of extension. I will just briefly comment on the 2020 case of Sharma against Military Ceramics Corporation, which is the latest case on the subject. In this case, the federal court at first instance offered certain comments on whether the court had the power to extend the window time period. Although these comments were made obiter, as the issue was not required to be decided by the court, these comments appear to be the most comprehensive statement of the court's views on the strictness of the window time period in Australian law. Citing the full range of relevant Australian and New Zealand authorities, Justice Stewart suggested that the weight of the trans-Tasman authorities heavily favoured the conclusion that the court had no power to extend the window time period and that the existence of such a power would be against the scheme of the model law and the policy underlying it. However, let me caveat that the issue has only been superficially commented on at the federal court level in Australia, although following other first instance federal court judges who have made similar obiter remarks, it is highly, un highly likely that a higher court will follow suit. I now turn to New Zealand. Their courts appear to have accepted as a given that the courts have no power to extend the window time period. For the viewer's reference, the cases are Optotiki Packing Against Optotiki Fruit Growers, decided in 2003, Downer Hill Joint Venture Against the Government of Fiji, decided in 2005, Todd Petroleum Mining Against Shell Petroleum Mining, decided in 2014, um, a decision of the New Zealand Court of Appeal, and Kaiban Investments Against Becca Corporate Holdings, uh, decided in 2015, and another decision of the New Zealand Court of Appeal. In all of these cases, however, the issue was either not disputed uh, or it was taken for granted by the courts that they had no power to extend the window time period. I now move on to Ireland, which is a model law country, and the case of Mohan against SM Motors Donegal Limited. 
This was decided in 2009, um, and Justice Clark in the High Court of Ireland interpreted Article 34.3 as creating a strict three-month limit in respect of which no possibility for an extension of time exists. Lastly, I refer you to Canada, uh, where after a preliminary search, I found one Canadian case, uh, which may not be very helpful because the strictness of the window time period was not actually in dispute. Um, the case is Ontario Incorporated against Lakeside Produce, decided in 2017 uh, by Justice Verbeam in the on, uh, Ontario Supreme Court, so, sorry, the Ontario Superior Court. Uh, and both parties uh, and the court accepted that the court had no power to extend the window time period. Having reviewed this selection of case law, I suggest that there are three factors that courts take into account when deciding how to interpret Article 34.3. First, textual interpretation of the provision itself, focusing on the actual language. Second, relying on Article 5 of the model law or any equivalent domestic provision to find a legal restriction on court intervention. Third, policy considerations which weigh on the court's mind, such as the desire to uphold the finality and certainty of arbitral awards, or notions about the court's proper limited role to intervene in arbitration matters. Looking first at textual interpretation, the main thing for the courts to look at is the proper interpretation of the words, may not. Do they impose a mandatory restriction which the court cannot do anything about? Or do the words may not imply that the court retains its jurisdiction to extend time for filing of a setting aside application, which is the only recourse left to the loser in an arbitration? We have already seen how Hong Kong and Singapore have treated this point. Justice Mimi Chan said that the words may not conferred discretion on the courts. But the Singapore case law has consistently interpreted the words may not as a mandatory requirement. Meanwhile, the Malaysian courts initially gave Article 34.3 a wide interpretation, but appear now to be returning to the orthodox position by holding that the window time period is strict. Another feature of textual interpretation is the extent to which courts should pay attention to, first, the legislative history of the model law, and second, case law from other model law jurisdictions, especially common law jurisdictions. Now I would like to talk a little bit more about Article 5 of the model law. As you know by now, Article 5 says that courts should not intervene in arbitration matters governed by the model law, except where provided for in the model law. Where it has the force of law, you would expect courts to seize on this provision as a way of neatly disposing of the issue of whether they can extend the window time period or not. It would be open to them to say that they do not have the power to extend time because the model law does not explicitly provide for this power. But looking at the available case law, we have not seen this line of reasoning being relied on that frequently. Of the cases we have considered above, only the Malaysian High Court decisions of GHW Reels, Kembang Sarantau, uh, and Triumph City, uh, and the Singapore case of BXS uh, against BXT, uh, as well as, surprisingly, the Indian authorities. All these cases are the ones that discuss the Article 5 restriction on curial intervention outside of what is provided for in the model law. Article 5 was not mentioned in either Sun Tian Gang or Tai Lao, nor was it mentioned in the Australian and New Zealand cases, uh, although it was in the Indian cases. Finally, the third category of reasons that courts rely on when deciding how to treat Article 34.3 would be policy considerations. One policy consideration that appears often in the relevant decisions is, of course, the certainty and finality of arbitral awards. For example, in the Australian case of Emerald Grain, um, the federal court said that the policy of upholding arbitral awards would be compromised if parties were not prevented from relying on setting aside grounds that they had not sufficiently pleaded within the window time period. Uh, in the Indian case of uh, Radha Bai, the Indian Supreme Court said that the court could not exercise its general power to extend time in respect of the window time period 
because to do so would create uncertainty and indeterminacy in enforcement of arbitral awards. Finally, the courts also often take into account the concept that there is a spirit of minimal curial intervention in the model law. Uh, in Sharma, the Federal Court of Australia held that the underlying policy of the model law was to restrict curial intervention in arbitration matters, both in terms of setting aside grounds and time. And this policy supported the proposition that the court lacks the power to extend the time in Article 34.3. In the Malaysian case of JHW Reels, Justice Arif said that giving the window time period a strict interpretation would accord with the principle of minimal intervention by the courts of law. We have seen that while several common law model jurist law jurisdictions agree that the window time period is strict and cannot be extended by the courts, and some even non-model law jurisdictions in the case of India, the decisions of the Thai Lao case in Malaysia and the Sun Tiang Gang case from Hong Kong unfortunately appear to be out of step with the transnational consensus. While harmonization is a goal of the model law, and undoubtedly a worthy one, it remains in the hands of the courts to interpret model law provisions with an eye to maintaining cross-border interpretative consistency. Some courts may find this an easier task than others. Hong Kong has directly adopted Article 2A of the model law, which requires courts to have regard to uniformity of application when interpreting the model law. Singapore does not have a provision that is as clear-cut as Hong Kong's. However, it does have Section 4 of its International Arbitration Act, which permits courts to turn to the model law's travaux preparatoire for interpretative assistance. And these travaux clearly refer to the goals of harmonization and uniformity. Unfortunately, the Malaysian courts have no similar legislative pro provision to fall back on in the Arbitration Act 2005. And this may explain the relatively inward-looking approach of considering chiefly domestic legislation interpreted according to domestic standards taken by the Court of Appeal in the Thai Lao case. However, if we take the three new Malaysian cases mentioned above, it looks as though Malaysia is heading for a return to the orthodox position. As for Hong Kong, the facts in the Sun Tiang Gang case from Hong Kong were so unusual that the decision will likely be treated as an outlier and will be easy to distinguish, especially as Justice Chan's actual decision on the interpretation of Article 34.3 could arguably be treated as obiter. When the Hong Kong judiciary comes to learn of the authorities cited in this paper, I would respectfully hope that Hong Kong will sooner rather than later adopt the conventional interpretation. To sum up, arbitration parties would be well advised to take note that the prevailing view in the common law model law countries points clearly to uniting all of their courts in holding that applications to set aside an inter international arbitration award will not be allowed after the expiry of the window period of three months, or in the case of Malaysia, 90 days regardless of how deserving their particular circumstances may be. There may be one glimmer of hope for late applications in certain jurisdictions, namely New Zealand and Malaysia. In those countries, there is a rider to the equivalent of Article 34.3 of the model law. New Zealand and Malaysia have an exception to the window time period, whereby that period of three months and 90 days respectively, will not apply to an application for setting aside on the ground that the award was induced or affected by fraud or corruption. This proviso is in Section 37.5 of the Malaysian Act and Article 34.3 of Schedule 1 of New Zealand's Arbitration Act. I do not have the time today to discuss this exception, especially as this is a ground that's also being relied on in the Bloomberg case which is now on appeal to the Singapore Court of Appeal. But please look out for the published version of this talk, which will appear in some journal prob pr probably around the end of this year. Thank you for your attention, uh, and I now return the proceedings uh, to the moderator. Thank you very much, Michael, for the very informative and obviously comprehensive uh, presentation on the Drex talk topic 
uh, for this session. Uh, if you would be patient and allow me a little bit uh, of time, I would like to ask you a few questions. Um, my first question, well, you know, under Section 37 of the Malaysian Arbitration Act 2005, it provides for an application to be set aside, uh, for an application to set aside an award where the seat of arbitration is in Malaysia. Uh, such an application must be made within 90 days from the date of receipt of the award. Uh, and, you know, it is a rather strict requirement. Whereas under Section 38 of the Arbitration Act 2005, uh, there is no time limit imposed for a party to apply for recognition and enforcement of arbitration award. Uh, and when that happens, uh, the respondent to that application may then raise objections uh, uh, with regards to the recognition uh, or enforcement of the award. In such a situation, the responding party uh, is entitled under Section 39 of the Arbitration Act uh, as I said, to object and resist the recognition on grounds that are largely the same as the grounds for setting aside of an award under Section 37 uh, of the Arbitration Act. Uh, the equivalent of Section 39 of the Arbitration Act of Malaysia uh, is Article 36 of the Model Law. Therefore, you know, there appears to be an inconsistency where it concerns an award where uh, the seat of arbitration is within the jurisdiction that is to say, a party is precluded from setting aside an award after three months as per Article 34 of the Model Law, or in Malaysia's case, 90 days as per Section 37 of the Arbitration Act. But the party is not precluding from raising similar grounds for the purpose of resisting the registration and enforcement of the award under Article 36 of the Model Law or Section 39 of the Arbitration Act of Malaysia. So really, in a nutshell, my first question to you would be, would you see this inconsistency as problematic? And if so, what would you think is a solution? If I understand you correctly, you are discussing the specific situation where there is a Malaysian seated arbitration and the award debtor of that arbitration has assets in Malaysia that can be seized by the award creditor. So there would be a three month time limit for the award debtor to apply that, to set aside the award, but no time limit for the award debtor to resist enforcement. Uh, that is a supposed contradiction. I would say that there is no contradiction here. To put things in more colloquial terms, let's refer to the award debtor as the loser and the award creditor as the winner in the case of setting aside, who is the first mover? The loser must take the first action and apply to set aside the award. But in the case of enforcement, the winner must take the first action. And it's clear that the winner has sole discretion for all intents and purposes regarding whether and when to enforce the Malaysian seated award within Malaysia. Of course, there is actually a six year time limit for the winner to register the arbitral award as a judgment in Malaysia, uh, pursuant to section six of the Malaysian Limitation Act of 1953. But obviously, the loser must wait for the winner to begin enforcement proceedings. The loser does not know when that will happen, and the loser must be able to respond if and when such an enforcement application is made. Therefore, it doesn't make much sense to compare time limits per se between setting aside applications and applications to resist enforcement. Uh, and now my second question. Under the Malaysian Arbitration Act 2005, there is an exception under Section 37, Subsection 5 to the 90-day time limit to set aside an award, namely where the award was induced or affected by fraud or corruption. This is not found in Article 34 of the Model Law. Do you think that this is a justifiable exception? Some other jurisdictions do have this exception. New Zealand is the first that comes to mind. That exception is contained in Article 34.3 of Schedule 1 of the New Zealand Arbitration Act of 1996. Yet the courts and other jurisdictions have chosen not to extend the time limit even for cases where the alleged ground for setting aside the arbitral award is fraud or corruption. Uh, this is the case in Singapore and India. 
In Bloomberg against Global Gaming Philippines, the Singapore High Court found that the three-month time limit for setting aside application was applicable even when it was alleged that there was a subsequent fraud that could not have been discovered earlier. The Supreme Court of India has taken the same position. In the 2018 case of Radha Bai and Ashok Kumar, the issue was the same. Could allegedly fraudulent acts committed after the arbitral act had been rendered and received by the parties constitute an exception to the time limit for setting aside applications? The Supreme Court of India answered in the negative. The Supreme Court placed great reliance on the rationale behind the Arbitration and Conciliation Act and found that allowing fraud to be an exception would run counter to the scheme and object of the Arbitration and Conciliation Act. My view is that it really boils down to whether one country chooses to favour commercial certainty over being able to do justice in certain rare cases. As I said in my talk, hard cases make bad law. The issue of whether to add an exception for fraud in the model law itself was expressly considered by the Angstrichal Working Group when the model law was being drafted. The result of that discussion was that it was collectively agreed that allowing a longer time limit to make setting aside applications on the ground of fraud was contrary to the ideals of speed and finality in arbitration. And the end product is the Article 34.3 we see today with no such exception. Of course, it's true that countries can modify their adoption of the model law to their own needs. Uh, if certain countries take the view that the balance between commercial certainty and fairness should fall elsewhere, it's open to them to make amendments or insertions to that effect, as New Zealand and Malaysia have done so. Thank you very much, Michael, uh, for that answer. Uh, and now to my third question. Do you think that the courts in any given jurisdiction should be given a discretion to extend or enlarge the time specified for the making of an application to set aside an award? And if so, uh, what would the criteria or circumstances for this exercise of this, such discretion be? Well, we see that the majority of courts in common law, model law jurisdictions have not found that they have a discretion to extend time for setting aside applications. Hong Kong and Malaysia, prior to the most two uh, most recent cases, um, especially uh, uh, Kembang Serantau, appear to be out of step with the transnational consensus in this regard. Uh, in the Sun Tian Gang case, Justice Mimi Chan did not attempt to set out a list of principles or criteria that courts might consider before deciding whether or not to extend time. Justice Chan relied instead on domestic Hong Kong case law that interpreted the word may in Article 34.2 as conferring discretion on the courts uh, and analogized that example to find that the words may not also confer discretion on the courts. So hers was a purely textual analysis uh, without adding any particular principles uh, of how that discretion uh, that was permitted was to be exercised. Compare that with the Tai Lao case, uh, the Malaysian Court of Appeal also did not attempt to list any relevant principles or criteria they simply assessed, asserted that they had absolute discretion to extend time uh, and made uh, a factual analysis of the relevant criteria in the particular case uh, they were considering. It's not surprising that these uh, two courts did not attempt to come up with a list of principles uh, or criteria. Uh, any such list would be purely judge-made law, given that the respective domestic statutes and certainly the model law do not hint at any such criteria that might allow a domestic court to extend time uh, for a setting aside application. So I would not try to put forward a view on what criteria may go into any such list. Um, however, I would say with some caution that if any jurisdiction wished to come up with such a list, A, it would have to be out of their own creation, and B, they should be aware that they would be out of step uh, with the general consensus among model law countries uh, other than the exceptions of fraud and corruption that already exist uh, in the New Zealand and Malaysian statutes. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and now for my next question. 
Uh, do you think there should be or should not be a time limit for a party to apply to set aside an award and why? And do you think that there should be more categories of exceptions provided for in a statute? And if so, what would be such categories? For example, could there be, maybe be an exception where a party being a person or a corporation is incapacitated from acting within the time period due to illness, insolvency issues or solvency issues, a natural calamity such as a tsunami or an earthquake, or ignorance of the laws prevailing in that jurisdiction. Uh, this may perhaps be pertinent where, for example, it concerns an international arbitration where the parties and their legal rep representatives are foreign to that jurisdiction. Well, I think that the main point is that countries that adopt the model law can choose to do so with their own amendments uh, and to adapt the model law to local requirements as they see fit. If jurisdictions do not include force majeure or other extenuating factors or exceptions, then they must be taken to have considered and dismissed the need to do so. Interestingly, your point about ignorance of local laws was pertinent in the Thai Lao case. The Court of Appeal did discuss the issue, and when deciding whether or not to exercise the discretion that they found that they had, the Court of Appeal placed some weight on the fact that the Laotian government had apparently not been properly advised on Malaysian law and the applicable time limits. But clearly, this is not a statutory exception, and it was just one factor the court took into account in weighing the circumstances of how to exercise uh, its jurisdiction. The net effect of introducing such an exception uh, without it being provided for expressly by a statute uh, would be to introduce inconsistency in cross-border interpretation of the model law, uh, which I would say would not be ideal. I would also say much the same thing about whether or not there should be a time limit for parties to apply for setting aside and presumably uh, what that time limit should be. If countries have adopted the model law in which there is a clear three-month time limit, they must be taken to have considered and accepted the implications of that choice. It would be a moot point to discuss whether or not there should be a time limit. In any event, certainly the vast majority of domestic court systems around the world provide for time limits to file appeals to court judgments. So that in itself is not controversial. The controversial part is how long the time limit should be and whether courts should have the ability to extend it. Uh, and I must repeat that countries must play by the rules they have agreed to. Thank you very much, Michael, you know, for answering all the questions and of course, for having taken your time uh, in being here with us and for your great presentation. Uh, I would like to express uh, our heartfelt thanks uh, for from everyone, and I now hand over the session back to Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for the excellent and comprehensive Drex talk covering seven model law jurisdictions and one quasi-model law jurisdiction in the Asia-Pacific region. And of course, Christopher for leading the discussion as Drex introducer. The conduct of this very first online Drex talk during these extraordinary times and participation from various jurisdictions is proof of the solidarity amongst dispute resolution practitioners. As I double head as Drex Fellow and Deputy Head of Legal at the AIAC, on behalf of both these institutions, I am grateful to our Drex speaker, Dr. Michael Huang, Drex introducer, Mr. Christopher Leung, members of the Drex Secretariat, and in particular, Mr. Shashank Garg, convener of Drex Talks. As we come to the close of the third Drex Talk, I take comfort and pride in the high standards that the previous three Drex speakers have set in launching this series, beginning first with Professor Douglas Jones in 2018, Professor Emmanuel Gaillard in 2019, and now Dr. Michael Huang in 2020. We also wish to acknowledge the supporting organisations of this Drex talk, namely the AIAC's Young Practitioners Group, the Malaysian Institute of Arbitrators, the Australian Centre for International Commercial Arbitration, the Thailand Arbitration Centre, Arbitration Ireland, ADR Institute of Canada, the Indian Arbitration Forum, 
the Asia-Pacific Regional Arbitration Group, the Global Arbitration Review, and the Inter-Pacific Bar Association. We also sincerely acknowledge the support extended by the Drex Talks Knowledge Partners, namely the Center for Arbitration and Mediation of the Chamber of Commerce, Brazil, Canada, Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, the Singapore Chamber of Maritime Arbitration, the Vienna International Arbitral Center, the MCCI Arbitration and Mediation Center, the London Maritime Arbitrators Association, the International Chamber of Commerce, and the Scottish Arbitration Center. This talk will be available in Drex Talk as well as AIAC's web platforms. Feel free to share the links with other members of the ADR community as we together promote and build a free knowledge bank from the world's best dispute resolution practitioners. For more events conducted by the Drex Talk and AIAC, please refer to our websites and social media updates. Thank you all and goodbye from Bangunan Sulaiman.